You can be what you want to be if you do what you gotta do. It all happens at Hillary's house where all you gotta be is you. Hi, Zanzi. Kim, Kim our brace of twins. I like it's yellow. I like your earrings. Thank you. These are some of my favorites, yeah. Actually, you know what? They kind of look like they came out of sacred space because they got like the wood, or they're wood and they've got those grooves in them. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. Where are you? I'm in Jamaica. Where are you in Jamaica? I'm in Kingston. I'm living the Kingston ghetto life, which is very interesting, but. I'm not like in the deep ghetto. I'm in the medium ghetto. Actually, let me say this. Nobody has been killed in my neighborhood since I've been here. So my background, for those of you who can see it, and even for those who don't, I will describe it, is a monument and installation called Sacred Space. And Sacred Space is, again, an installation and a monument that was created by Antonius Roberts, who is one of the significant elders and innovators in Bahamian contemporary art. And this particular monument is women hewn from the stumps of casuarina trees. And casuarina trees were brought to the Bahamas from Europe. I was, always, I was taught that they came by accident, like they were trying to bring something else, but they brought these instead. They, they got the wrong tree. I say a lot of people now would probably consider a casuarina tree to be a native tree um, because it certainly is a tree that's found abundantly in the Bahamas. The sacred space is located at Clifton, which is now was created into a place called Clifton Heritage Park. I bet if you went Clifton Heritage Park and you were a tourist, what you will probably learn about sacred space that these women are meant to represent the uh, women who came on slave ships from Africa to the Bahamas. And Clifton is right next to the tongue of the ocean, which is the deepest water in the Bahamas. Quick geography lesson for those who don't know, the Bahamas is about 100,000 square miles as a nation half of that is including including the water I was say, yeah the mo including the water most of that is water. mostly is the water yeah 50 percent of that is water more than 50 percent of the water is less than 30 feet deep the tongue of the ocean is six thousand feet deep so that's a it makes it very easy for ships to move in and out and that shallow the shallow water is part of why the bahamas traditionally was a place of so much wreckage and uh, piracy because it was easy for ships to ground or wreck. In any case, this, is, this was a space where it was safe to bring ships in. And there's a staircase called the Pirate Staircase, which is where, the, where pirates and uh, enslaved Africans would come up off the ships and onto land. That's kind of the history of the monument, but in no way is it the history of the women. A lot of history, a lot of Bahamian history, a lot of American history has the beginning of these women. These women's history starts at that moment where they stepped off of the slave ship and then stepped onto this soil. And so what I was hoping that you would do is Tell me, tell me the story of these women in your perspective. Hmm. These women. Hmm. You know, I find it interesting. I'm, I'm going to start by not answering the question. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I know, right? <laughs> it's interesting to me. You know what I thought about when we're talking about the Casarinas, the Casarinas were brought into the Bahamas, right? I would have known the entire Cable Beach strip, that whole strip along Good, you know, Goodman's Bay, the Casarinas are still there, but that entire strip 
straight along the cable beach strip was Casarina trees. One that was very, it was a cooling kind of sphere. And I would, I would have known these trees as a child, you know? And when landscape is so important to, to understanding or to your perception of a space, not only that, but your, your, the way that you identify with the space, you know? And so those Casarina trees, I'm sure many other Bahamians would agree with me that they were very, very important to the landscape and to, you know, giving a sense of also ownership because even on the, on the beach front, especially on Saunders Beach, those Casarinas provided shade for people who, who went to the beach and they also prevented the erosion of the shoreline and the whole rest of that. But anyway, I remember when there was this new movement, everybody was saying the Casarinas were an invasive species, you know? So then everybody decides now to just cut down all the Casarina trees, okay? So we're now left with these ugly stumps of these beings that were once so beautiful and also protected and guarded the shoreline, okay? And now then, of course, everything, so everything, the shoreline began to erode. Um, when the hurricane came, all of those businesses on the, the front space on Bay Street destroyed the whole work. So, you know, I find it interesting that Roberts would use the Casarina as the base to make these women, you know, because it kind of speaks to the same kind of story. You know, you've been taken from where you were, uprooted, you've brought to this place, you've, you've been the protectors of the space, and then suddenly they want to chop you down. Suddenly you are no longer important to the space, or suddenly maybe it is that you, you are then suddenly confronted with the fact that you're not valued in the way that you should be. So I would say that it's, you know, it's ironic in a way that these people, these women, and not just these women, because I think these women are representative of the nation of people, the, the, the majority of the people, because it's out of these women that everybody comes from. So these women now, we're now in a, in a, in a situation where we're still fighting for a little piece of ownership in our own little space. And if it's one thing that Dorian and this pandemic is showing us is that we don't have anything in our little space. Yes, we may think that we're rooted like the Casarina trees, but really and truly, this is not where our roots are because the land and the, it is not supporting us. You know, and as hard as we fight, um, we, it's, it's as if we're getting nowhere. And you're seeing it a lot with the way that things are going. I thought the same thing, which is why I specifically brought up the Casarinas and that they were also brought over and it was kind of a mistake. Just like the Casarinas, you, you can't truly get rid of them, but you're still, you still try to chop them or cut them in half, you know? You still try to chop them down. So you, you still see the little vestiges you know, you still see, you still see the shoots trying to, to, to struggle up, you know, in the midst of all the fake sand and the, the fake palms and the fake everything. And this is what I don't get, right? So they could, this, this is my thing, right? You can extrapolate from this what you want. So you, you bring in the Casarinas, right? Okay. Suddenly the Casarinas are invasive. They're bad. All right. They're, they're criminals. Okay. Suddenly, these people, these, not, yeah, well, you know what I mean. These trees, these trees that you take up from where they was happy, okay? You bring them to another place. They, they, they settle down. They, they figure out a way to grow in the so-called unfertile soil, okay? Then suddenly decide, you know what? No, no, these, these people are no good. Oh, these trees, sorry. These trees are no good. So what are we going to do? We're going to try to get rid of them. We're going to try to stifle them. But no matter what you do, they still keep coming back. They still keep proliferating. How does that correspond with your observations of and experiences with the Bahamians as people? I think if it's one thing that being in Jamaica has taught me is to appreciate my people at least them people is mine. At least I know them long time. At least I know how to deal with them because Jamaica has definitely been, 
an eye opener for me. It's definitely a very frightening place. I'm forcing myself to not read the news or follow up on the news so much because where I live, I'm not having the uptown experience. Let me put it like that. I was not so fortunate to be one of the regular students that are able to come live on campus. As a matter of fact, the campus is beautiful and lush. I'll tell you that the campus is fantastic. I was not one of those who was able to go and rent a thousand dollar apartment up in Beverly Hills or anything like that, you know, but, um, you know, having, having exper experiencing the space from this perspective has been very, very interesting, but at the same time, it's also frightening because I'm, I'm in a space where, I, I, as we know, Jamaica has the highest violent crime rate in the Caribbean basin. You know, and that is actually really not a joke. And I, I can understand why, because the disparities between uptown, downtown, from the haves and the haves nots, the gap is so wide and it's so glaring that you can't help but be confronted by it, you know? And for someone like me, who I'm not coming out of a quote-unquote downtown experience at least out of the Bahamas to now be in a position where I wouldn't say that I am fully living the downtown experience but I am in close proximity to it and observing it when I first came to Jamaica I stayed with a friend of mine and it was kind of frightening because the very space that I was staying in I left from there and not even maybe a month and a half later some guys came and shot up the place and shot her little boy who was there in the very same room that me and my children were staying in. I was like, oh shit, yeah. this is where I am. Mind yeah. you, the space is beautiful. It's just, you know, people killing each other. They just killed an eight-year-old baby the other day. Oh my God. Like point, point blank range. The child is on her porch doing what children do, you know, and I'm like, what the hell? And that's not to say that the Bahamas is not, I know we carry on bad, we carry on bad, but, you know, at least I know how to move in my own, in my own home. But that's Jamaica for me. Okay. Getting back to the people who came to the Bahamas from Africa, can you talk about, from, you, from your understanding, based on what you know, the history of what was brought from Africa to the Bahamas and also how that history remains alive even as it's transformed and evolved over the last couple of hundred years? Well, first off, the Bahamas, you know, is a, one of those classic melting pots, right? But then obviously the majority of people would be, or um, can claim some kind of African ancestry. So if we're talking specifically about African people and their legacy in the Bahamas, I would say that despite our efforts to kind of suppress the kind of um, the Africanness in the Bahamian, you know, I think that uh, it, it persists and it persists strongly. <laughs> African people were not able to bring very, very much with them. One of the few physical things that we can say that we brought was okra. That came across with African um, food. Um, but aside from that, what we really brought was our memories. We brought our tongue, we brought our culture, we brought we and 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 many people don't want to acknowledge this but we did bring our religion we did bring our our spiritual systems and those spiritual systems still persist despite what people may want to think or believe Obea is still and its related practices is still very very strong in the bahamas i'm actually taking a course right now called african religious pretensions in the caribbean and Every single time they get on the topic of Obea, I'm like, you know, 
you know, we got, we, we are the home of the Obea men and women. This is the capital. Y'all can talk with y'all of Obea, but y'all ain't trying to, y'all ain't have real Obea. Y'all got Obea. Y'all got mixed up Obea. You Obea. know, we got Obea, Obea. I had to, I had to let them listen to Tony McKay. I was like, y'all so scared of Obea. All right. We ain't scared. We ain't never scared. I said, we got a whole, we got a whole um, um, Obea man making music on the world stage. Obea, Obea, Obea is in me. Right? So I'm enjoying that. So for me that I think those that's one of the, the one of those major retentions that, that um African people still have in the Bahamas, even though we try to deny it. You know, even though we try to deny it, even though we claim to be Christian, even though we claim to be all of these other things, it is still there. It is still there in the fact that we we continue to have wakes for the dead. We continue to honor our ancestors. We continue to um, we don't throw water out of the yard, disrespecting the spirits. Okay, um, despite everything that we say, um, um, we we maintain who we are. And don't you think even in some of the a lot of the Christian rituals there's even still a very deep sense of and retention of African spirituality and African uh, styles of rituals? I personally think that Black people, and that's Black people everywhere, have latched on to Christianity because it so closely mimics what you, what you know. You know, the work with the, the blood. We know that, all right? We know about making sacrifice. We know that. We know about um, making offering. We know about tithing. We know about, about the, the, um, the concept of, of reciprocity. We know about all of these things. We, we know about spirits. We know about God, you know? And so it, it, for me, I, I, don't, I, I can see how it was very, very easy for people, for, for, for African people to, to move themselves into this new space, um, this new um, religious space, and not only do that, but make it their own, you know? So you still see, even in these spaces, I know people who are staunch Christians, okay? But when trouble really hit, they are going, they, they're turning to what they know, and they turn into that magic. And for everybody who is watching this and saying that, you know, no, I don't do them things. And guess what? <laughs> you ain't got to lie to me, boo-boo. I, I know you all know. We know you know. And we'll just leave it at that. But it's there. And I don't think that it's anything to be ashamed of. You know, it's nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, it's something to be extremely proud of. And this is us. You know, in these kinds of times, I saw on the news the other day, there was some medical official that was saying that they were they were cautioning um, against the use of traditional bush medicine in the treatment of coronavirus, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, to, first off, y'all ain't have no cure, one, right? Mm -hmm. Y'all ain't have no cure for coronavirus. That means that when you catch it, that you go to the hospital, they give you paracetamol, if you get real bad, they put you on a ventilator. Okay, but at the end of the day, your body is either going to win or it's going to, to lose. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out why you can tell people not to use the medicine that they know has helped them for millennia. And this is, this is not reactive medicine. This is preventative medicine. This is medicine that works to build the immune system. This is medicine that works to, to, to cleanse the body. We know this is what the medicine does, but you're trying to tell us, you're trying to tell poor people not to use what it is that they know to fight something that you ain't got no cure for. It ain't like, it ain't like you telling us, don't go drink our neem bush because you all have the definitive cure. You basically telling us, don't drink the neem bush because we want you all to dead anyway. In the very beginning, there was a video being sent around of a Bahamian doctor recommending that people make the pine needles tea because there's a constituent, one of the terpenes in 
pine needles has had been determined to potentially treat coronavirus. Now there wasn't there wasn't in my opinion enough information to determine whether or not that could be true or where that was coming from or what kind of pine. And so people are like, oh yeah, everyone I'm like, yeah, you know, I could just see all the Bahamians going out taking any pine needle. There there are some pine needles that are medicinal and some that are poisonous. They did not just you you know someone's gonna go out there just picking whatever pine mm. they see trying to make the tea out of it, right? I'm like, mm, maybe that's not a bad, that's not a very good education. But anyway, it was interesting because I had not ever seen a white Bahamian MD talking about using herbal medicine before. Yeah, I, I also didn't think that it gave enough information. You know, if it if it were something that people could use, um, yeah, it, it, it was just not specific enough. What I did, is I, I firmly believe in neem. I have my, my, my magic combination. Neem, Moringa, and I just stick in whatever else I need for whatever the particular ailment is. So whether it be aloe or echinacea or blueberry vein or whatever. But I have learned in dealing with small children and fevers, I, I had an experience where my son, um, I gave him, honey you just not supposed to give honey to children under maybe i would even say a year old because it is extremely toxic anyway he had it because i didn't know and i told you the boy came down with the worst fever that i ever experienced with my children so we were in barbados at the time i took him to the hospital the doctors couldn't see they didn't want to see him i waited there four or five hours he continued to get worse and you know i was with a friend of mine at that time and the friend she had her daughter there and i i was literally at my wits end because it had been maybe about five or six hours waiting with a, a seriously ill baby um with an extremely high fever and you know i'm a i'm a 20 year old mother i don't know what to do and you know the little girl said um, to her mom, um, let's go home. Why don't you give him some of the some of the tea? And I said, you know what? Doesn't look like I'm going to get any help here at this hospital. So I left. I left, and I was I was literally I I you know when you this your first baby you don't know nothing about nothing. I could have swear this baby was going to die. I thought that Amari was going to die. How awful it was. And you know we went home. And I said, you know what? I just, you just gotta try and, and trust. And my friend, she mixed me up some echinacea with garlic tea. Within 30 minutes of giving that to the baby, that fever went down. And I continued to give it to him through the night, sponge him down. By the next morning, he was 90% better. By the following evening, he had recovered echinacea and garlic i will never forget it so you could say whatever you want but i firmly believe in the power of the bush and what i do every single time when you see the um, children when they when they start to get a fever i whip up that neem tea or that neem bush knock it knock it right out kill it immediately when was the first time you were exposed to the bush well, you know, uh, growing up in the Bahamas, when, yeah, it's it's just something that's normal. It's a part of, at nursery school, they used to line us up, um, line everybody up to get a shot of Cerise. That was part of the regular routine. I remember that clearly, because nobody looked how it tasted, but it was part of your regular medicine, you know, at home. Talk about Cerise, for people who don't know who that is. Nursery? Cerise. All I know is it's a bush. That's like what everyone's Grammy gave them, right? It's like if you take like Cerise, Cerise is like a cure all. I was gonna say it's like a panacea, a Bahamian panacea. Yeah, it's there's nothing better than Cerise. But talk about the taste, though. Oh, it's just horrible. But I will say it does not taste worse than neem. But it was a, a common bit of that I I just grew up drinking it, Cerise, and then you had fever grass for when you had a fever. I would say that those two I know very, very well. Those were the go-tos, Cerise 
and I know fever grass. And then of course you have your ginger and your turmeric, but I remember ginger more so. And my great grandfather, when, when we had a cold, he would mix, he'd melt down the butter in the pan with a whole heap load of honey and plenty, plenty sour lime. And then you drink that down and then your cold is just, everything's better after that. It's just wonderful. I think I think a lot of that might be the placebo effect as well, but who cares? You know, it's just perfect. That's kind of how you experienced bush medicine growing up. You also talked about how there are components, there are pieces of African spirituality that are woven throughout Bahamian culture and woven throughout Bahamian spiritual practice generally, regardless of one's what one claims to be one's spiritual or religious orientation. Well, when did you first understand or realize what African spirituality is? When do you feel like you were first exposed to that particular form of healing practice? Let me say this. I would say that my entire life, the, the culture is informed by African cultures and spirituality. There's so many things that we do, that we learn, that we, that we are, that is informed by that. But I would not have learned to identify these things as being African in origin until I became um, maybe a teenager going into adulthood. It's kind of like being in water, being a fish in the water. You don't know that, you know, it is the water until you have an experience outside of that. And so in, in retrospect is when I came to understand that, hey, all of these things that, that we do normally, just as simple as the knowledge of the herbs and the, norm, the knowledge of, of bush medicine, this is something that we take as just normal and true. These are traditions. This is knowledge that has been passed down through the oral history for hundreds of years. And it survived. It survived the Ma'afa. It survived the Middle Passage. And it continues today. It's just that they've really done a number on us in the sense that we, it, once you begin to label something as African, people become frightened. You know, and I think that is one of the greatest tragedies of what people have experienced. But in time, it will pass, you know, and then we just got to continue moving on. But we can't say that our, our way of life and cultures have been destroyed because we still, yeah, we just got to keep moving, keep moving on. And, and back to your question, in terms of me actually actively um, moving into African spirituality that happened maybe when I was 18, 19 or so. I was actively moving in that space. And even prior to that, I was fortunate enough not to have parents who were hyper religious. We were not forced to go to church. Um, my mom always said that Sunday is a day of rest. So I spent my Sundays reading lots and lots and lots of books. Um, I read everything I could get my hands on. And, you know, we just never had that kind of pressure. We never had the, the abuse. I, I'm going to call it abuse. We never had the abuse of somebody telling us that we're going to go to hell if we do this, or we're going to go to your city, you're a sinner and all that. The, 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 the most that I got of that was at school. I went to Catholic school. And in Catholic school, it's so boring anyway that, you know, none of that stuff really, really stuck. You know, it was sin and venial sin and mortal sin and all the rest of them, sin and all them things there. Yeah. I just, honestly, I think that is abuse. To be telling little children that you're going to burn up in a pit of uh, hellfire if you don't do this and you don't. And I don't think morality need, has to be based in punishment. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of productive. That's why we have problems today. So what happened for you in terms of, you, t you talked about making an, a, a conscious decision to align yourself with African spirituality, what did that look like or how did things change at that time? Or did they? Did you, did you just kind of continue um, doing what you were always doing and being who you always are, kind of understanding in your mind what was happening? No, I went through a woke stage. You know, people would say that you're coming into consciousness 
and you begin to wake up and your eyes begin to open and then you're you're in you're you're just into conspiracy theories and then and then you start to tell all your family members fun white jesus and i don't know run and cussing people out and just you know you eh, look here my people watching this y'all know the stage y'all know the stage <laughs> <laughs> and i love Listen to me. I've been on a little bit of a platform over the last few months about there's no such thing as being woke, getting woke, right? Like the truly woke person understands that when you're woke, like you are always awakening. Like you are never stopping being awakened. But so like, when you're in that place of like, I'm so mm -hmm, woke. Mm -hmm. <sighs> in, in retrospect, what I what I learned is that because I've, I've seen other people kind of it's like, it's like an unavoidable stage. Oh, and I think it's just yeah. anger, you know? Um, yeah, it, it, people, people just become angry when they find out that a lot of what they have been told and taught about themselves is not true, you know? And, that, and, and to actually learn that you have entire agendas, agendas that are hundreds of years old designed to oppress entire groups of people to enslave entire groups of people you know when you when you actually realize you know because and, and then when you actually realize that it wasn't so long ago either and that these things continue you know um and i'm gonna mention here ahmaud aubrey all right they continue they continue they gun that baby boy down right in the road in coronavirus y'all have nothing else to do nothing else to do but be gunning people down in the road like you can't catch a break but I think, I think when you begin to so-called become woke, all right, you go through that angry stage. So you're basically blasting off at anybody who's still running on a run that you ain't running on, you know? And then, well, for me at least, so I went through the stage and I, all the typical things, you know, you grow your locks, you start to smoke some weed, um, you start to hang out. With, with other people who are doing the same thing, and then you start to gaze into the stars and do all of these things, all of these folk things, right? Well, that's how it happened for me. And then, so now, I actually turned 30 last month, right? So I decided, and I, 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 I don't know, I just got a, a revelation. I became even more woke. Yeah, I think we're definitely always awakening. But so, so you talk about that phase, and there's a couple things that I want to talk about. Can you talk a little bit about why, in particular, for people of African ancestry, the relationship between natural hair and consciousness? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, hair is definitely, for many people, the starting point. Especially for Black women, hair is that, is that point of contention. You know, We have hair that has been called unmanageable. It's nappy. It's hard, it's picky, you know, it can't comb. You need to put a little perm in that. You know, the movement is shifting now, but you're coming, you're coming up in, 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 in the kind of mentality around you that your hair is not good enough, you know? And that's just a, a one step removed from saying you're too black, you're too ugly, you're too dusty looking, you know? You're, you're looking too African. You know, and these things persist. I personally would say that I did not experience that in my home because I always had a mom who she was woke long before woke became was even a thing. Yeah. You know, she cut her hair off when she was 16 years old because she and she never grew it back because she was in complete rebellion against the European standards and ideals that persisted around her, you know. So I always grew up with my mom. My mom cut our hair every so often. So we always had it low and cut short. And even when we had hair, when she was braiding it, she would say, oh, this is some nice thick, thick black hair, eh? You know, and this is some nice thick fat hair. And it just, it, it was always this, this sense of, you know, bigging us up. It was always a, it was always a big up, you know? Oh, you, you a beautiful brown girl and, uh, don't never let no tell. And, and as we got older, of course, the conversations changed. I remember um, um, she, her telling me, you know, you know, Zanzi, one, you're a woman, and two, you're black. And so those two together, you're a black woman in this world. You know, she was just very real about it. You got to be twice as smart. You, you just got to be so off the chains. 
that they can't deny you, you know, and that's just a fact of life. Nothing is that, that you're going to have to work harder because you have, you have all of these things stacked against you. And that's just the fact of life. That's the kind of space that I came out of. And then also to my father would have been instrumental in, in terms of helping me and, and not just me, his, all of his children to, to kind of, um, settle themselves in their own identity because if it's one thing that my parents and, and many of their other, their generation realized is that the loss of identity was truly the greatest tragedy you know for for us as a people you know and when you have people that don't have an identity you don't have a grounding or pride in yourself. And when you don't have pride in yourself, you're not able to stand at the table or to stand with, with other people who know who they are, you know, and truly be yourself and command respect. But yeah, for me, the, the hair thing, it was, it was a way to, to further rebel because when I was at SAC, there was a, 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 a certain person up in power at the school who said to me that my afro was too big because I used to wear it picked out and in a puff all the time. And he said it was too big. You need to perm this. Why you don't perm this hair so that you could look like sense, right? And then, of course, you know, me being the child of the people that I am, I was like, no. What I can perm this for? I'm a, I am, I am a black woman, and this is how the hair grow out of my head, and it just stay like that. So you're talking about your dad, and you're talking about how your dad, for your dad, identity for both of your parents, identity is really important. You talked about how your parents' generation lived through the independence period. So for people who are not familiar. The Bahamas gained independence in 1973. And so people who were coming of age during that time, that, that was a huge, a huge moment of, you know, that was the official moment of decolonization. And your father has a legacy, a cultural legacy of understanding that political, official, formal decolonization is not the end of decol like that's the that's the starting point for understanding identity for developing identity for sovereignty for decolonization can you talk a little bit about your father's legacy generally culturally and also how he has influenced a little bit more about how he has influenced you i think that the best way to to even speak about legacy and influence is to speak about how he's influenced me because who who he was to the public or who he was in different spaces was not the person that I would have known you know I knew who I knew the Bahamas got a different type of person you know they got him in a different kind of capacity as I knew him he started as my mentor he introduced me to art he introduced me to language from a very, very young age. And he also introduced me to satire and cynicism and um, the importance of wit. He introduced me to, to all of that, you know? And so it's because of him that I have a deep and profound love for satire. I think that I owe the development of my pretty dark humor to, to, to his influence. Lots of people would not remember him um, favorably, right. you know, but there are also many people that do. And I can say personally that I've had, I've had both experiences. I know. I have completely hated him and completely loved him in my life. And that's, that, that, I think that just really is a testament to the largeness of his personality. Yeah, I love that. Um, that's who he was. I, I, I think about him every day, really. I think that I've, I've lost a great many parents in the past short little while. My great grandparents, my grandparents, everybody decided to die like right after each other. But I think that, was, that one was really the, the worst in terms of emotionally yeah. because we were so much alike that we we didn't like each other you know 
I do know. But we're also so much alike that we we really that we really we really did like each other, you know. So um, it's kind of it's kind of one of those things where I don't have anybody to read my my stories to, who who who's going to give me the kind of response that I'm looking for, you know, or the kind of critique. I don't have anybody to show my artwork to who's going to really get into the nitty gritty of what it is that I, I would like to hear about it. That space is gone for me now, but that's who he was for me. He was, he, he was instrumental in helping to create who I am. The crazy part as well, because I am batshit crazy. And that's definitely, you know, that's learned. But what's life without that? It's very exciting. Okay, so we have our Kmar bracelets on. We both have our Kmar bracelets on. Kmar has a Jamaican accent now. He speaks like pure, hardcore Jamaican patois. That's amazing. But anyway, my Kmar bracelets. I started make. I started making these just after he was born because he was the most fantastic baby that I've ever had. Kimar bracelets, they are on sale after coronavirus. What is your favorite Bahamian food? Like when you think about being home and like comfort food, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Guava duck. I just made guava duck yesterday. Matter of fact, I have some guava soaking right now to make another guava duck. I got my rum sauce in the fridge. Who's your favorite Bahamian artist? I make Kung Fritters too. I got Kung Fritters in the freezer. Oh, look. Tony McKay. Uh, Tony McKay, hands down. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Are you the, the, uh... You mean visual artist or musician? It could be any. But I was going to say, I got the young Thai coconut strips, like the ones that are like that thick. And I've been marinating them for like three days so that I'm I buy them and fry them. I'm gonna fry them. I'm gonna like tempura them to make them like tempura conch. We'll see what happens. I'm really excited about it though. I I used to make that years ago. Yeah. We call it coconut wish. Not fish, wish. And then I was with my ex-husband we came up with that concept we're using the soft jelly coconut but it can't be too it can't be too hard but it can't be too soft well i have the vietnamese grocery right across the street so they sell it the perfect texture love that place so they have the the soft coconut they have soursop juice and the soursop tea and i can get papaya that are actually ripe and mm. green papaya because I've been all about the green papaya, but also like, you know, I can't still go to the groceries. I mean, one of the cool things about this neighborhood that I'm living in now is there's so many different ethnic groceries. And so I could actually get fruit that's ripe, not like at the regular mm. grocery store where it's, you know, it'll be like green. three weeks from now it'll be ripe, but. Well, that's one thing I won't complain about in Jamaica. I know, I see your pictures. The vegetable market is massive. And it's wonderful, and there's so many, you know, ripe papaya, papaw, yeah, ripe everything. It's now pineapples, just cut pineapples, and watermelon just came out. Mm. So I'll spend like thirty dollars and get three weeks worth of food from the from the um, the market. A family of six, three of whom are going through a growth spurt. Lola was so dry up, but now Lola just eaten. She just eaten all the time. Okay, so go back to the your favorite Bahamian artist. Yeah, Tony McKay, definitely. I think he's just a genius. He's a bona fide genius. Mm -hmm. And underrated and underappreciated in the Bahamas, definitely. My favorite visual artist, I definitely love Lillian Blades' work. She had been my favorite for a long time. But in terms of contemporary work, Jody, Jody Minnis, mm -hmm. really love her work right now. I love where she- Her work reminds me so much of your work. work. Yeah. She reminds me of, um, of you. I would even say that. I would say that she she she's at that level that I want I want be at. I I'm just getting a lot of you know the feels you know the work is is vulnerable you know and you can see that you 
you can see that she is she's working through herself she's working her way into yeah. herself and i love i love seeing that process you know because and i think it's comforting too to see that process because i'm i'm also in that space and you know but she just makes it look so so easy yeah you know and, and she, she definitely got it going on she makes it look very she, she has an elegance about her too like she makes it yes. look very graceful even though i think anyone who's ever been through it done any type of self development personal development self-reflection growth knows that in real life the internal experience is never as graceful as she's making it as, as, yeah exactly and, and there's the other thing is it's so vulnerable and so raw and also so graceful at the same time so i shout out to jody she's definitely i would i would i have a, a lot of favorites right now but i'm i would say that her work is is really doing it for me and then um you know what i really love too i find that a lot of a lot of my contemporaries at least spend a lot of time on the technique they spend a lot of time on the, the skill, but they don't spend a lot of time on developing the voice or developing concept or developing the emotion that the art is supposed to convey. So I feel like we get a lot of contrived work. And that's not to say that that's not part of the process, you know. Everybody's going through their own process. But I, I would say that um, what I see in Jody's work is she definitely has the skill she definitely has the technique but her work is not predicated on how well that technique can be executed it's it's about what she's trying to say it's about the process it's about the concept and it's about the emotion you know so yeah. she's she's not allowing the pursuit of technical greatness to hinder the development of true craft for that that's like you know striking that balance i just think she got it going on what's exciting you right now generally speaking learning how to do tattoos that's what's exciting me oh yeah talk about that so i started getting tattoos when i was like 13 or 14. i was sneaking down to the tattoo shop and at that time unbeknownst to me okay letting these amateur tattoo artists just write up on my body right and then of course you're 14 and 15 and you're like this is the coolest tattoo ever and now i have a bunch of shit tattoos so when i started to get woke i stopped getting tattoos and i was like you know that's not what woke people do and you know my body is a temple and all that kind of stuff right so anyway now that i've passed through that stage i'm now 30 now so i'm definitely back into tattoos and piercings and all that exciting stuff so since I'm older now uh, and my skill level has increased and I'm no longer intimidated, you know, I, I, I had wanted to do tattoos before, but I always felt intimidated. I didn't think that I had the, the kind of technical skill necessary to, to do it. But anyway, since I'm 30 now and, you know, that's basically like 40 years away from death, I'm going to be doing everything that I ever wanted to do. So I always said that I was going to get like two PhDs. So I'm working on that. But when I started making jewelry, I said I was going to be one of the best jewelers in the world. So I'm working on that. I think I'm going to go into making gold, goldsmithing. I'd always said I wanted to do tattoos at some point. So I've picked that up as a hobby now. You know, that's exciting me. I, get, I tend to get excited about new things. I remember when I learned how to crochet, I started crocheting and I was like, I'm going to be the best crocheter ever. I crochet like every single day, every single hour for like maybe a year straight. And I just stopped crocheting because, you know, I moved on to something else. I remember when I was at Raw and you used to sit outside at the table there and make your jewelry. Yeah, that was that stage. I mean, I still make jewelry, but it doesn't, it's not exciting me like that anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know. Maybe I'm just a fickle person that craves excitement. At one point, I was just into food, and you know, I did Green City and all of that, and that was exciting. Then that kind of petered out, 
I'm just frightened that I'm going to spend the rest of my life seeking excitement. But I don't care. I'm 30 now. So this is about excitement. I'm going to spend the next decade just in excitement. Well, you're probably not going to get any PhDs then because PhD and excitement aren't necessarily words that can go in. No, I am an odd type of person. I actually love school. I love school too. School and your PhD are very different things. To me, my PhD was my greatest part of my journey of personal development on many levels, but it's not exciting. Actually, one of the things I've been saying is that everyone with a PhD is probably either doing fine during coronavirus or being triggered as fuck during coronavirus because <laughs> when you're working on your dissertation, you're alone all the time. You're completely by yourself all the time and working all the time. You're locked up in a room all the time. It's extremely lonely. I mean, for me, it's fine because I love being by my, I, I have no problem being by myself for long periods of time. But, mm -hmm. you know, more than half of people working on PhDs end up, you know, having seeking some sort of mental health care because it's not really sustainable for really anyone. Well Honestly, you know why I want a PhD? So I can tell everybody to call me doctor. Because I'm a Bahamian. And we're the type of people, we braggadocious. I want to hear about all of that mental health stuff right now, Hillary. I'm thinking about how, you know, somebody may miss and call me miss. And I'm like, no, doctor. Because as wonderful as a person of a person that I try to be, I will not deny that I am a Bahamian. So I'm trying to be a wonderful person. But I'm also a Bahamian who's going to force people to call me doctor when I get my PhD. By the time you get a PhD, there might not even be a system, an academic system. Well, no, the academic system better stick up. You know what? No. Let it crumble. That's even better for me. I will build my own shit. Where are you now? San Diego. You said you're in a, in a wonderful neighborhood. Okay. I like you. You say you, where were you before? I've been in San Diego. I was in Delaware. So I'm in California. Every time I hear about America, like when you say San Diego, I think about these far, far, far away places, you know, where everything is, is so exciting and you have ethnic brochures and lots of different types of people in one place. San Diego, generally speaking, is not a particularly diverse place at all. I just happen to live in the most diverse neighborhood, but it's extremely diverse. Like when I talk about an ethnic grocery, within two blocks of my house, there's two or three Vietnamese groceries. There's a Chinese bakery, a Chinese herb shop, an Ethiopian grocery, a Middle Eastern grocery, a Mexican grocery. It is really, really diverse. That sounds like my kind of place to be. Yeah. I like food. Can I call you doctor? A good doctor? You can call me doctor. doctor. Yes. Do you not remember when you got your, when you finally got your PhD and I said, make sure you make everybody call you Dr. Booker. Yes. yes. And I have, I have you not. Know why? Because you worked for that. Look, I worked so hard for that. But yeah, I have kind of like denied myself of that, but now I'm, I had to have this kind of moment of releasing a lot of stuff, but now I'm like owning that at a whole new level than I've, than I've ever owned it. Listen to me, you better own that. My grandfather got his PhD, okay? You couldn't call him by his name no more. He became doc, real doc. You know how you work for that? Look at it. you work for that. And you work for a whole a whole name. You work to have a title. All right? So what if people think that you're pretentious now? It's doc now. Doc. All right? All right. That's what it is. You work hard for your shit. You work hard for this paper. Why do you think I I have not registered myself in my married name at school? They will never know that I'm married because when I get my degrees, I'm just gonna have my name on it. Bring the godchild. Bring Adesina. Yes, bring the godchild. Godchild getting rude, Hillary. She is your child. You know how you are. She's two now. How you're your father's child. She is your child. Hi. Don't look at yourself. See Hillary over there. Okay. <laughs> like what's going on? Hi. 
She's so cute. Hi. She named you, you know. She gave you a name. Yeah. How are you? What are you doing? What have you been doing today? Hi. Gotta hold it up so she can see. <laughs> <laughs> see how fat she's looking? All she's doing is eating. She's, she doesn't look fat. She's so cute. She was small and dry up and very, very tiny. Like yeah, a month that. and a half ago. You look good to me. Bye. Who's this man? Hi, Amari. How are you? Good, good. You got an earring? Let me see. Show, come, show. Come, come closer. Bring the red man. Is that your phone? I think you look like Joe. He definitely looks <laughs> like Joe. Bye. 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 I'll see you. The political situation in this country right now is so outrageous. First of all, no one knows who to believe about anything. So I'm kind of like, I have several friends who are nurses. So I kind of been, they're on the front lines, right? They're dealing with this every single day. They're seeing what it looks like. But at so I am listening to them and, and really, you know, kind of bearing witness to their experience. And also, you know, there's different research that's coming out that's talking about, you know, well, what is really the rate? What's the death rate given the infection rate? We don't, there's no way of determining what any kind of rate is because we don't know who, like how many people have actually have it. Oh. I suspect that the, the infection rate is much higher than, than Oh, you know. I'm sure that it's exponentially higher than what we know. But if people aren't getting tested, then we don't know. So you know what I had a thought about too today? I think that a lot of these deaths too are fear related. Look, when I, this first came out in the beginning, the message that kept coming to me was that the fearful will perish. Yeah. That is the kind of thought that came to me because, okay, I was, I'll say this from my observation. When it first hit Jamaica, right? And the first cases started coming in. Within the first two weeks, the, the people that died from it, they died within the first two weeks. And that was when the numbers were only at like 20 something or whatever. Those people died um, rapidly. After the hype kind of died down, you know, we're up to like 400 and uh, almost 500 cases now. And nobody else has died you know once you begin to settle into something the last death that was covid caused was not because the woman had covid it was because the people were frightened that she had covid i don't know if you heard about and you heard what happened hillary was awful it was a, a 23 year old woman right a young woman she went into labor right mm -hmm. and she had paid she had paid to have her baby at the private hospital here so she presented herself at the private hospital she was complaining about difficulty breathing and she had a fever from what i heard the nurses and the rest of them said oh she have covid everybody went screaming refused to treat her refused to touch her so they turned her away from the hospital this is a woman in active labor now turned her away from the hospital on suspicion of her having covid she went down to the public hospital, to the public um, maternity hospital um, in Kingston, which is supposed to be the largest one. The first hospital, actually, they told her that they didn't have any space. They didn't have facilities for isolation. So they turned her away. And so the second hospital she went to was the main hospital. They told her that they were at capacity, so they couldn't accommodate her. This is a woman, keep in mind, labor. The woman says she can't breathe. She called her physician. The physician tried to get her set up to, to go into emergency C-section. And guess what? Couldn't go ahead on time because the anesthesiologist said that they're not going to do any work on somebody who has COVID. So they couldn't get a proper anesthesia, um, anesthesia team together to put her under for C-section. Drove her down to Spanish Town Hospital. Spanish Town is almost an hour away from Kingston. Spanish Town Hospital turned her away. Came back to Kingston, to the UE Hospital, all right? 
by the time she got to UE Hospital, and by the time is that doctor was actually able to find um, anesthesiologists who are uh, willing to work and, and put her under and put her into quote unquote isolation and all of that. The woman died from a heart attack, dead as a fucking doornail. You'd be dead too if you in active labor, you need an emergency C-section, the nurses them running from you because they think you have COVID, the anesthesiologists, these are doctors who have, who have taken an oath to do no harm. They scared. You, why, why are you going to go into the profession of you if you ain't ready to, to, to handle what them? All of that caused the woman to die, all right? And guess what? This is on the suspicion of having corner suspicion. You know how many diseases have fever and difficulty breathing? And like when you're in fever, it's normal for you to have, a hard, like, yeah, you could have a hard time breathing anyway. If you have a big a sucker <laughs> the side of a goddamn watermelon stuck up inside oh, your belly, oh. of course you're going to have problems breathing. If the, tr if the thing trying to get out and you can't get it out. I did briefly see a thing the other day that perhaps uh, they're going to be trying to test the vaccine on Bahamians. Did you see that? Yeah. I saw, and I saw the government, the government said that they're willing to, to, to be the test ground. Here's my thing right now. Any medicine that somebody wants to test on another human being, I feel like they should be willing to test it on themselves first. Yep. But guess what? I didn't hear anything more about that because the PM said that. Okay, Bahamas didn't pay him on that, and they follow that up. You understand? Because I know my people, ain't nobody, they, the PM can say whatever the PM wants to say. It ain't gonna happen. Because right. Bahamas, Bahamas, they ain't allowed it to happen to themselves. One, they scared. They scared of anything. And two, they skeptical. Okay, so the PM could talk all the talk he want to talk. It does have something to do with poverty levels as well, too. You know, yeah, you, you, you can't really say that, yes, we do have people living in abject poverty in the Bahamas. Right. It's there. It happens. But the culture is not a culture of poverty. So right. even if you yourself live in abject poverty, that's not something that you speak about. That's not something that you, it's just not something that is the, the big culture. Okay, ain't nobody, ain't nobody, yeah, you may be a sufferer, but you ain't talking about how you is a sufferer. I think that poverty on, on, at, its, at its various levels has a lot to do with who is going to become guinea pigs and who is not going to become guinea pigs. Bahamians ain't it. We're already skeptical about people and they, they, they drugs and they this and they that. And everybody saw the, everybody saw the documentary about AIDS and how, and how they, they chuck it in the people in the Congo and, you know, we, really, we don't really trust you that much. I think we're going to be all right. I'm just worried about, we're having a quote unquote pandemic. The whole, the entire world is shut down trying to stop a virus. I'm presuming that they've shut the world down, trying to slow the spread and hoping that they come up with a vaccine to replace natural herd immunity. But the question is, you know, how are we really going to develop this herd immunity? You know, are we going to shut down every single time that there is a, an outbreak? So the question is, where do we go from here? Do we take our risks and try to develop natural herd immunity? What do we do? Really, what do we do? Do we wait on a vaccine that could kill us even faster than the actual virus? For me, from the very beginning, why has the focus been on developing a vaccine and not on teaching people how to support and build their immune systems well because exactly that would, that would render the medical system obsolete yeah. hi <laughs> in the fall of this system and moving into the development of a new system i want to be a significant contributor you know i want to be influencing that mm -hmm. i want to be part of okay how are we going to do this what do we need to do in order to create a system that actually supports everyone? Lifestyle medicine, you know, how can people do well? How can people develop their immune system? How can people um, also connect with one another, really and actually, and work together and build community? So that's what I'm moving towards. Guess what? I think if it's, if it's one thing that we're going to learn out of this experience, is that we are social beings 
you know, and that we, we need each other. We need contact. We need, you know, because we're feeling it now. We're really feeling it now. You know, we, we need these kinds of spaces to mediate this experience. Baby for sale. We're going we're gonna to ship you off to Auntie Hillary for an entire summer, a whole summer. And you ain't coming back early, neither. Again, you come back late, if anything. She can, come, she can come help run Hillary's house. Yes. Look here, before you go, we got to find a way to send me some of that food. We just be posting so much food. I'm going to start a food vlog. Send me a picture of your next market trip. And I'll try and make oh. the stuff that you've got there. I'll take some pictures. Okay. Okay, say bye, say bye, say bye. Bye. Okay. Talk to you later. I love you. Bye, Lola. I love you too. Bye. I love you too. All right, I'll see you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.